Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, where we were joined in the Soho Theatre London by the incredible Sally Phillips. Now, a lot of you will be excited by that, I'm sure, because Sally has been on the podcast a couple of times now, and she is so funny. She is just one of us, really. She loves doing the research. She loves facts. Uh, Just for anyone who doesn't know who Sally is, she is basically the doyen of British comedy over the last however many years. She's She was in Smack the Pony. She was in Alan Partridge. She played the Prime Minister of Finland in Veep. Uh, she, I mean, she's been in everything. You know who Sally Phillips is. You're really going to enjoy this show. Uh, I don't really have much more to say, so I might as well quickly say, don't forget to join Club Fish. If you want to, go to nosuchthingsoffish.com slash Patreon or nosuchthingsoffish.com slash Apple if you want to do that. Loads of bonus material, ad-free episodes, all sorts of stuff on there. A few weeks ago, we gave away a Cabbage Patch doll. And actually, that reminds me, once you've listened to this show, do go on to our various social medias because you will be able to see a couple of props that were used in this show. I'm sure we'll post them up, so definitely go and check those out because they're absolutely brilliant. Look, I don't want to use up any more of your time. I'm just going to say, on with the podcast! Oh, nice. Hello, and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast this week, coming to you live from Soho Theatre. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray, and Sally Phillips. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Sally. So I was entranced by the Finnish Hobby Horse Championships that was doing the round on, <laughs> on Twitter. And also I was in Finland when they were being held. Unfortunately, you didn't make it. Um, But my fact is that the world's best hobby horse jumper can jump high enough to theoretically clear the first two jumps in the Grand National. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing. How many of you saw it? Did anyone see it? It was really amazing. It's the Hobby Horse Championships. It's mainly girls between 11 and 18 that are okay. interested. <laughs> and is it one? Can't afford a real horse. Is it on BBC One? Like, where are they? <laughs> the girls are horribly bullied. Okay. Yeah, oh. by their compatriots for, really? for being into it. Yeah, there was a film called oh. Hobby Horse Revolution. Oh. <laughs> 2019. It's, it's a big thing. It's right. like, once you look into it, it's fun. And it's, it's some boys, but mainly girls, and some adult women, but I think that's a bit strange. They <laughs> o- often... They often go into Woodland and do it in secret. <laughs> so they don't and give away their, their yeah, moves? No, yeah, or? S- n- no, so they don't get attacked. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. And uh, they start off, most people make their own hobby horses because a pro hobby horse costs about 300 euros. Right. Wow. Yeah. What, and just, uh, and uh, the sorry, bridle we're, is. We're talking about the stick with the head yeah. of the horse. Yeah. 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 So it's the realism that's the expensiveness, is it? Yes. Or are they like oh, yeah. aerodyne? Is it like Nimbus well, I 2000? Don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. But okay. my partner and I, yeah. because we knew this was live and we love the show very much, this afternoon spent a full 15 minutes each making everyone a hobby horse. What? No. Yeah. No. 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 What? Oh my God. Oh my God. What? So, Andy, for the people who can't see this, for the people who can't see this, bad luck. This is indescribable. It is incredible. This is amazing. Yours does look a tiny bit like a like bad date night, girl. So you think? <laughs> Mine is, um, it's a very colourful sock, which is stuffed, and it has a mop hair and some eyes. And yeah, I love it. Andy, Thank you yours? so much. Mine is it's ultra realistic, I would say. This is, <laughs> this is a horse. Yeah, mine slightly looks like he ran out of materials and gave up. Um, <laughs> Yours is very cool. It's very kind of like space horse. But mine's very space, like a uh, glam rock sort of. <laughs> yeah. This hair is like very yeah. uh, Led Zeppelin it's from the year 3000. I, say, yeah. I, I did that one. I'm quite pleased with that one. And this one's made out of uh, bandages, a planter, and it's got radishes for eyes. Oh, wow. <laughs> 
This is incredible. Sounds so so incredible. The girls, you. Well, I thought, I mean, I, I kind of thought we could maybe have a go, but that would be, well, that would be oh, too embarrassing, gosh. wouldn't it? Or maybe we should get the audience to have a go, do a bit of dressage. <laughs> 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 because what would happen is it would be, there was loads of different disciplines. <laughs> Everyone's putting it down. Don't make me do it. Don't make me move. I'm a geek. I don't like, I don't like physical it. action. Yeah, they do show jumping. They do puissance, which is the only time you're allowed to run a, a, um, a jump with... You're allowed to run at it rather than canter. Right. Oh. And, yeah, that's the, that is the one where they've jumped a, a whole Peter Dinklage. <laughs> Four, oh, is that how four tall Peter foot, is? Four foot seven inches. Four foot seven. Four wow. foot seven inches. But there's also, um, a, you know, show jumping. They, they do, the international is 80 centimetres, the jumps. Yeah. Uh, but the fins so dominate that their jumps are one metre, 10 centimetres. Wow. wow. Uh, so 10,000 hobby horses in Finland, wow. in Finland That's alone. That's incredible. Is there a reason? But it's spreading, it's a reason I don't know. But <laughs> is there a reason it hasn't got further or that it's so it's got finished. quite far right, it's, okay. it has actually got quite it's got okay. so much further than you'd think <laughs> <laughs> sometimes all the, the nordic nations canada ukraine yeah yeah it's in yeah. so many places it's but sometimes quite it's northern isn't it it's quite a north northern europe and canada like places where you have long dark nights with not much else to do <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah well you say that you say that but i mean <laughs> At least they're nice to the horses in, oh, yeah, uh, in the Nordic nations, whereas our pretend horses have a dark, dark history. Right. I'm talking about the, huh? none of you came across it, the Padstow, Obby Orstow. Oh, the Obby Orstow. Yeah, these, these but the scariest yeah. one is in Wales. In Wales, they use real horse skulls. Up for the hobby on a horses. stick. Really? Yeah, with this isn't This real... isn't teenage girls doing it, though, is it? <laughs> Wow. Well, the video I saw it's was like, like an tours. elderly man go with some friends <laughs> goes goes to the door of someone's house and then sings quite a scary song yeah. in Welsh. And if you cannot finish the song inside the house, they force their way in. Okay. And yeah. there's a lot of chasing girls with horses. And it's quite. It's all sort of strange. Yeah. Folky Very rituals, strange folky yeah. rituals. Right. Yeah. Well, there are loads of these rituals all yeah, over the place. Yeah, all over the, the place. UK. There's the there's you said Padstow, which is another one. There's the Hoden horse in. Did Kent. you see the Padstow? Did you look at yeah, that online? It's... It doesn't look. I mean, it's really bizarre. It looks like a grand piano. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> but with a tail and a thing sticking out the front. Then they sort of rock it. Yeah, they're kind of a bit ritual. Very but strange. Is, yeah. is this what is this where the pantomime horse comes from? No, because these are really weird. Sort of ritual fertility yeah, no. things, but it's nothing to do no, with the pantomime. No, nothing, nothing to do with the pantomime horse. Well, no, not a, well, no not it's okay. really strange. It's it's yeah. the Lord of Misrule, so it's the spirit of. Well, that that's but, what Google told me. What is a, like, <laughs> I'm what being. Is, I'm talking like. What I've is got, a pantomime horse? But a kind of you know that's a sort of misrule thing, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's unnatural. Horse. It's weird. Yeah, it's I guess so. Who's in the front? Who's in the back? Yeah. <laughs> no? No one yeah, else? Yeah, that's the... Uh, you would get on really well with Kate Beckinsale. Yes. Did you see this? She, oh, really? She, she travels with a pantomime horse everywhere. She does. Yeah. And she reckons it's like really what? good. Well, it kind of calms her down if she's stressed. Wait, sorry, with, with people in it? <laughs> well... Does she... <laughs> like an emotional support animal? <laughs> <laughs> she brings the costume around, okay. and then if she's got a bit of downtime, then she'll get in it, and she'll find someone else to get in it with her, and it's just a nice way of calming down, relaxing. And... That's <laughs> very normal. Um, <laughs> um, I think the biggest problem on the sort of a PR level is that no matter how you try and spin it, it always sounds nuts when you say the thing you're actually doing with hobby horsing. Like, I found a quote from someone who said, people assume that it's a game or that we are more or less crazy said chairwoman of the Finnish Stick Horse Enthusiast Association. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to make it past the description, are you? It's a, it's a hard thing, but it sounds like an amazing... I genuinely think, you know, people always talk about at the Olympics, like, why not have someone in the 100 metres who's just a citizen who's just running alongside and you yeah. can really see how fast they're going, having a 12-year-old girl at the Grand National <laughs> make the first two and just stack it <laughs> head first into the third. That would be amazing. Actually, imagine you had a pantomime horse, the fastest pantomime horse, in the world, yeah, and they are in the 100 meters. You know it's a person, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, two people, and they're in the 100 meters in the first ever Olympics. Yeah. Where do you think they would finish? So, uh, sorry, oh, wow. oh, in the first ever... So, oh, first ever Olympics, 100 meters race, you've got the two fastest current yeah. pantomime horse people. Yeah. Where um, would they finish in the race? Because oh. people did run a bit slower, didn't they, in the first Olympics? <laughs> yeah, but they didn't have Why? a pantomime horse yeah. costume on. 
<laughs> Why? I just. I'd well, speed. the first Olympics that was Greece. <laughs> no, Greece? just like shoes. Ancient, 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 ancient Greece. Shoes. Oh no, sorry. In no. 1996, the first modern. The modern ones. Right, first modern. Just shoes were less good, Dan, and they hadn't. They hadn't like you know. Maybe yeah, yeah, some, maybe yeah. someone died in the in the right. Oh, race, okay. No, they, oh. This is just oh. honestly, it's just a straight up. Question. I'm going to say yeah. bronze. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say bronze, but yeah. no, no, I'm going to say silver and bronze because they count as two people. Very clever. Very clever. Yeah. I'm going to say gold. No, well, oh. Dan is right. They would have oh. got silver. Um, the fastest is 12.045 seconds for 100 meters. And that wouldn't quite have gotten gold in the first Olympics, but it would have been the second place. Does the oh, nose of the person in the back of the pantomime horse have to get over the line? No, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Just the That's front. amazing. Yeah. Can I go back to hobby horsing? Yeah. Just because there's one fact I'm just so desperate to share. Yeah. One of the rules of the hobby horse competition is that only stallions and mares can take part and geldings are banned. <laughs> <laughs> gelding? That's gelding like, being a, a, a where are those, muted young horse. Where are the testicles on this well, that's thing? That's what I mean. <laughs> they're that's all geldings. What I mean. yeah. They're, they're, yeah, well, exactly. That's bizarre, isn't it? But that's in the rules. That's amazing. Wow. Incredible. Pantomime horses, I mean, that is the worst ever job. I mean... I have you ever think, done that? No, I've, I've never, never, I've never, I've never done that. I've oh, never I've done never. that. There were some pantomimes that sometimes use real horses. Right. Because John Barrowman was thrown 20 foot off by one. They <laughs> supposedly trained horse, they threw him off. <laughs> in Glasgow in 2013. And Crikey. there was a, a Paul O'Grady always used to tell a story about being in a panto with a trained horse that he had to get into bed with him. He used to follow him around. He was playing the fairy godmother in Cinderella. He used to follow him around the stage with a massive erection. <laughs> and and he, he couldn't. He couldn't say anything because there's loads and loads of kids. <laughs> and they're all going, it's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> Good grief. That's pretty cool. Oh. Here's the thing about this is the thing about real horses now. Yeah. yeah. If you I don't think we've said this before, if you frown at a horse <laughs> and then go away yeah. and then come back, it will remember and be a bit more <laughs> James is doing some stunt work for the people listening at home. <laughs> Um, it'll remember that it'll you remember. found that. Him. It'll remember that you found. Oh, oh and if you, but also if you smile at a horse and then go away, it will think, oh, there he is. You know, oh. and, okay, the horse remembers you frowned. How is it then showing passing that, that data on? Yeah, exactly. So it's bizarre. It's which eye it looks at you with. Oh. So horses look at negative or threatening sights with their left eye and positive ones with their right eye. Really? So if if you come back, you know what the horse thinks of you depending on which eye it looks at you with. That's really interesting. Yeah. So horses understand human facial expressions? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because wow. a lot of animals, if you smile at them, they'll see the teeth and they think you're being aggressive, for instance. Mm. Right. So interesting. Okay. Like most like, comedians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you know that it was illegal to dress up as a horse in Scotland in the seventh century? Really? Yeah. Uh, okay. In fact, it was uh, it was forbidden for any man to dress as a horse or a wild beast and dance anti-clockwise during January. Yeah, it was demonic. For, well, that's well, the thing about dressing up as an animal was mm. to let your demonic side out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was seen as very anti-Catholic and stuff. Um, St. Augustine wrote that anyone carrying on that most filthy practice of dressing like a horse should be punished most severely. <laughs> oh, wow. But, it, but as soon as the 1st of February hits, knock yourself out. <laughs> We're doing no horse January this year again. <laughs> That's fine. Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everyone. We'd like to let you know that this week we are sponsored by LinkedIn in jobs that's right you all know linkedin it is the number one destination to go on to talk about your business world your working life and make new connections with people out there but also with linkedin jobs it is now the perfect place to find people for your business yeah all of the best people who might work for your business are going to be on linkedin so we're better to go there's no point going to a town hall square and just shouting out who wants to come and work for my business because <laughs> 
<laughs> you're probably not going to find the right people. You need to go where the talent is. That's right. And it makes it super easy for you to find the person that you're looking for. So if I was trying to hire, let's say, a fourth member of Fish, I would have many simple tools enable to make my decision better and easier, like screening questions like, James, hello, tell me, do you have a great fact that might be relevant to our show? Actually, yeah, I do have a fact. The fact is more of a question. Mm. Uh, who are we replacing? <laughs> um, you look for the candidates with the right skills. That's an example of a bad answer. James would not have been hired as a result <laughs> uh, in this situation. And that means that you can screen them properly and work out if they've got the right skills and experience and quickly prioritize who you want to get into your business. Uh, that's right. And if you would like to post your job right now, you can do so for free by going to LinkedIn. That's L-I-N-K-E-D-I-N dot com slash fish. That's right. So go to LinkedIn dot com slash fish and you are going to be able to post that job ad for free. Terms and conditions apply. OK, I'm going to the town hall square to see if anyone needs to employ a new researcher. On with the podcast. <laughs> On with the show. Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that this June of 2023, the 6,666,666th English language Wikipedia article was created, and that page was an entry for SatanCon. Ooh. Yeah. Um, you've got to imagine, obviously, that they were aiming to land that, but that's really hard, right? So SatanCon being... Is that like Comic-Con, but with devils? It pretty much it's, is. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, the, yeah. It's, it's, it's set up by the Satanic Temple, who are a non-theistic organization, and they have this annual convention. Uh, it was in Boston this year. It was on April 28th, which is my birthday, so that's mm. very exciting. Oh. Congratulations. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite new, SatanCon. Yeah. It's only been held twice, I think. And okay. this year, th like, So this year was in Boston at the Boston Marriott Hotel. So good on the Marriott, because you would think, <laughs> oh, maybe there'll be a reputational concern if we host <laughs> SatanCon. But they said, no, you come and have the conference here. And I think that's really good. Because um, they know, but the first one got lots of placards and it got lots of protests outside satan yeah. con one where you know in 2022 denouncing satan and this sort of thing even though the satanic temple don't they don't believe in satan they don't no. the, they say they lie that's yeah. the point wow. that is the point oh. of satan. Oh, yeah really good point yeah, yeah. oh that's no, worrying. really good point because yeah. <laughs> they do they do run satan after school clubs and <laughs> I was thinking <laughs> for my kids. Well, and even if they, <laughs> even if they don't believe in Satan, they're yeah. not helping themselves by calling themselves a satanic temple, are they? No, well, they're, no. Really, they're, they're sort of more of a free speech organisation. Uh, that's really. what they say. But Andy. no, you're right. It's all <laughs> you're being such a good sucked point. in. Oh God, I've fallen Satan right for it. Satan, Prince of Lies. Well, that's his I name. Get, why did I get this pentagram <laughs> tattooed on my back? <laughs> oh. They use the proper Latin greeting uh, for instead of saying "Hail Satan," who they don't believe in. I don't, I'm really on the, the <laughs> temple side. They they say "Ave Satana." Um, What's that mean? Hail, Hail Sa Satan. Like, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it scans the same as "Have a banana," which I really like. Ah. Ave Satana. That's how you can remember it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like them. Yeah. I think they're oh, good. Do you? Yeah, they're kind of rationalistic. Well, there's a few of them around, aren't there, who claim to not be interested in Satan, but are called the Church of Satan or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're all, a lot of them are like just trying to take the piss out of the government, yeah. out of the church, out of all that kind yeah. of stuff. In lockdown, I um, started presenting a religious program on Sunday mornings <laughs> called mm. Sunday Morning Live. And we, under the BBC, had to interview every religion that's recognised as a religion. Oh. So I didn't actually do it, but they uh, interview the Satanists. Really? Uh, after... Oh. Is that like a proper religion then in the UK? Yeah. All so oh, right. Okay. Yeah, Wiccan. Wiccan, And yeah. the lady who came, I didn't talk to her, actually, but she came, she'd been up all night... <laughs> Doing <laughs> what? In the woods ha with a horse? Having satanic sex in the woods. Uh, no. Basically, yeah. And, and the big issue for Sunday Morning Live was that <laughs> she wasn't wearing a bra and you could see really, see her nipples really, really clearly. Oh, wait, was, wow. it, was it radio or TV? What, TV? All three of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, why would that story gonna... be relevant if it was radio, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> 
how I'm are we so... going to gaffer tape the witch's <laughs> nips up? <laughs> Wow. Okay, so the Wiccan thing is a bit different, yeah. Was the, she was she satanic? Like, did you feel that she was pushing? I, the I didn't particularly talk to her. No, I did. I, I think they. Do, yeah, no, I, no, I don't. They, no, I don't think so. I think. That, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know I what happened, I didn't but it sounds like whatever <laughs> spell she put on you is just suddenly kicked in. <laughs> Honestly, I'm a bit. I'm a bit scared of of witches and satanists. Yeah. So, yeah. so is David Bowie. So it's fine. Mm. <laughs> he yeah. was once exercised. He got uh, someone to do spells of protection. Right. Well, uh, he used to him. collect his urine in little bottles, kind of like how Hugh Hefner did, because he was worried that witches were going to steal them and do black magic oh, on them. Oh, no. Uh, what? Yeah. He, yeah. But he, he didn't went through all of it. <laughs> what do you mean? He can't have collected all of his urine in bottles to prevent theft. <laughs> because that's such an unsustainable... I mean, I know he was rich. I know he was like a wealthy yeah. guy. If someone had enough money for jars to sustain every passing Imagine of urine. Imagine how much Bowie. it would fetch now. And I absolutely would buy some. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, of course. But I also think, like, if you just piss it down the toilet, yeah. that's probably safer than keeping it in bottles in your <laughs> it's house. It's so much safer. Yeah. Yeah, it must be, right? Because once right. you've got it in bottles, people... No, but you're forgetting about filming trailers. Because, <laughs> oh yeah, but, yeah, in filming, because there was, a, I think I, I might have made this up, <laughs> but I feel like um, there was a, an issue of people uh, going to Justin Timberlake's filming trailer and trying to steal his turds Oh, because it's held oh. in a tank. It, yeah. yeah, yeah, of course, no. yeah. Did I dream that? <laughs> that would be so worrying if I did. I feel that was a thing, though. And what were they yeah. going to do with it? Were they going to clone it? eBay? Him? <laughs> oh, right. Mm. No, no, just use it and, put, and use it for spells, I guess, was his... We've got to remember that this is a guy who was so coked off his head that he was collecting his own piss in bottles. I don't think there was right. logic to his reasoning. I think he just was scared of right, a... Okay. Of, but there is a whole thing of collecting, you know... Um, Hairs and stuff, isn't well, yeah, 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 I mean, I so that's so. the thing. The um, Yoko Ono used to be seen as someone that potentially, you know, she had an album called Yes, I Am a Witch because she was presented as someone who might be a witch. And mm. she bought a single mustache hair off of Salvador Dali. She paid him uh, for it and he sent it over in a box. And years later, it was revealed by the partner of Salvador Dali that he was so scared that she was going to use it for witchcraft that he ended up sending a painted bit of blade of grass that he picked from his lawn. But she never noticed, according to the story. But so he was petrified that Yoko Ono yeah, would Yeah, well, there that. was the whole yeah. satanic panic, wasn't there? Oh, yeah. I don't, was it 70s and 80s? Yeah. Where well, they 80s. thought McDonald's were haunted? Possessed? Who, McDonald's? There was the whole, no, the whole satanic panic where McDonald's got a letter from a woman in Ohio asking why the owner... Ray Kroc was a financial supporter of the Church of Satan. Oh. And it was a rumour that just spread... Huh. She said she'd seen him on the Phil Donahue show saying he supported the Church of Satan. And he hadn't said that. But she told her pastor, and her pastor put it in the church's newsletter, which was called Moments of Sunshine. <laughs> 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 and very quickly that spread across oh, yeah. America via church newsletters. Wow. <laughs> so McDonald's had to send executives out to these churches with sworn statements insisting that Croc never said those things. It was a real panic, wasn't it? Yeah. And the expert on it these days is a guy called Dr. David Frankfurter. Uh, <laughs> and what he thinks is it was basically like a sort of a loop where you would have these evangelical Christians saying this is happening and then people using hypnotic regression techniques to try and remember things that they supposedly yeah. suppressed in their lives. And then really what they would do is kind of say what the hypnotist wanted them to say. You just had this kind of feedback loop that eventually there was, you know, in theory, in some of the newspapers, they were saying there were thousands of these Satanists around America doing this. Yeah. Um, i got a fact for you. Okay. In 2021, in the UK, more babies were named Lucifer than Nigel. <laughs> do you have the numbers? Do we know how many? 15 Lucifers. Yeah. No more than two Nigels. No. Yeah. Oh, my word. It doesn't appear on the list. You know that thing where if there are under mm. three, they don't say don't how yeah, many there yeah. are. And yeah. do we think that it's because Nigel is associated with evil these days? <laughs> <laughs> Did you come across a, a thing of 666, though? Yeah. So I'd always thought that 666, the number of the beast, was about um, the number of perfection being seven and so six being imperfection. Oh, okay. ah. right. That's what I thought it was. But then today I discovered that there's a thing called isocephy, which is letters equivalent to numbers. Oh. And apparently this was very, very common in first and second century CE. So you would quite often 
um, refer to people with a number. So a joke was, by Suetonius, a calculation knew Nero his mother slew. And in this case, the emperor Nero, Nero equals 1,005, which is the same value as the phrase his mother slew. And apparently most people think if you say 666, it stands for Caesar Nero. So in some early versions of the Bible, in Revelations, from Revelations 13, the Latin version has the number as being 616. Right. And that's yeah. because in Latin, Nero is 616, not yeah. 666. And the reason we think that is because Revelation was written by very early Christians. It's one of the earliest of the New Testament books. And really, they were just being persecuted by Nero, so they saw him as the devil and oh. whatever. But he was actually a, a good, 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 good <laughs> guy? Uh, well, I wouldn't go quite that far. I mean, okay. it depends what side you're on. If you're on Nero's side, he's a great guy. <laughs> um, he used to drink an energy drink that was made by soaking <laughs> roasted dung in vinegar. Oh, no, but that's still how they... That's, that's Red Bull, that is. <laughs> no, that's Steven Seagal's energy drink. Have you seen those adverts? Oh, yeah. No. They're unbelievable. I've not seen the ads, oh, but... You've got um, to see the ads. What are they you've called? You've got to see the ads. What's it called? Oh, I can't remember. I His, used to drink it all the time. what? Yeah, I don't know why. I, why. I went through a period... Well, my local corner shop just stocked things like Marley's Mellow Mood, which was a Bob Marley energy drink, but it was sort of an what? opposite. A it Bob was Marley a, energy drink? Yeah. <laughs> it was a sort of Bob Marley anti-energy drink, and it said on the side, whatever you do, don't drive a truck after two of these. <laughs> and the, yeah. the store, I just... It had all, like, the collection of every celebrity's uh, weird... You know, it had a... What's amazing, Dan, is that this was at the end of your street. You would be the only person in the world who would buy this stuff. Yeah, exactly. They probably only... They were like, oh, we accidentally ordered this one time. Oh, it's selling every week for this one guy. Let's keep getting it. It was yeah. really powerful, his drink, yeah. Yeah, the Steven yeah. Seagal one. It's the most misogynistic advert I've ever seen. Really? Oh, really? And he's not even bothered to turn up. You just have to watch it. Okay, that wasn't it's on the... It's the awful. Can. It's, um, really, no, it's really... I can't believe I was the sole funder of that <laughs> ad. <laughs> it is time for fact number three, and that is Andy. My fact is that roughly 3% of our entire planet is called Jason. Um, <laughs> How much yeah. is called Nigel? <laughs> I'm shrinking amounts, yeah. So this is an amazing... Okay, this is amazing, right? Now, this is not... 3% of all people on the planet are called Jason, right? This is 3% of the Earth itself is named Jason. By whom? By... Jason? <laughs> by geologists and seismologists. So there is... Okay, this is a bit technical, but there are these two mysterious... I sound like Dan when I read this out. <laughs> there, are, there are these mysterious structures inside the Earth, right? There are two of them, okay? And they are they're these massive blobs. They're called LLSVPs large low shear velocity provinces, right? Now, there's one beneath Africa and there's one under the Pacific. Um, and that's obviously a very, you know, technical name for them. Um, and they're not very well known about. They're not very well researched because they are where the mantle of the Earth meets the core of the Earth, okay? So the Earth goes crust, not very much, mantle, quite a bit, core, quite a bit more. And they're at the, the junction point between the, the uh, mantle and the core. So they're really hard to research, and the researchers have named them Tuzo and Jason. <laughs> they are billions of years old, and between them they are Both sick. blokes. Too. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, it's true. They're named after two geological scientists, so they are, yeah. Um, and they, we don't know what they are. They might be, they might be offcuts from another planet, which is Ooh. exciting. There's a theoretical planet called Theia from four and a half billion years ago, which might have crashed into Earth and might have been subsumed. That's possible. Right. Um, yeah, we don't know exactly what they are, but they are incredible, and they're there. And this... <laughs> I don't know why I'm having to justify their existence. This is proper... <laughs> just spent 15 minutes talking about Satan. With, like, <laughs> well, these are real geological structures in the planet. They're awesome. No, yeah, it was yeah, wonderful. Right. Um, where... <laughs> why aren't you more excited? Well... <laughs> In all honesty, it's because an eBay auction uh, came up on my phone saying you've got three minutes to bid, so I suddenly was focused on that. But, Are you joking? Um, well, I didn't bid in the end. How much was it for that swimming pool of David Bowie's bottled urine? <laughs> Are we saying that there's... Because the description I read is that it's, uh, there's mountains there that are taller than 
Mount Everest. Yes. And but, fact, yes. But what does that mean? As in, it, then, there's no. Yeah. It's not the hollow earth we're talking about, right? There's no space around the mountains. <laughs> no. It's just different. It's different rock that might have been yeah, this yeah. other different rock. mystery so, planet. Yeah. And in fact, near Jason and Tuzo, th there are these enormous mega mountains, and they're at that junction point as well. They they are called ultra low velocity zones, and it's this weird boundary zone. I did read something. I can't get my head around this. Scientists claim that the gap between the core and the mantle is bigger than the change between rock and air. No, I can't understand that. <laughs> yeah, but, what okay. does that mean? It's so because what? of the high pressure, right? I right. guess. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That is amazing. And they're only found because scientists can track um, earthquakes through the earth and you spot where the reverberations, how long they take to get through the earth, and you can build up a profile yeah. very slowly and carefully of what the different structures are based on how fast so the, uh, waves so this travel. This is just news to me. that Right. Because... Um, and last time I did geography, I was a child, and I thought it was... Uh, then there was magma. <laughs> the mantle is much more fluid, and then the, there's an outer liquid core and an inner solid core. So, yeah. Um, there's space around Jason. No, that no was space. me. No that space. was me. No space, space at all. Yeah, no that space was Dan saying the whole So in what earth. sense is Jason a mountain? It's a different type of rock. Like, it's, you've got the sort of quite liquid uh, mantle, but you've got much more solid rock, which is this Jason stuff. Is that right? That's right. To say? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's really interesting these are named after blokes because actually quite a lot of this science was done by women. Mm, right, so yeah. a... Um, Sorry, did you say you were surprised? <laughs> <laughs> Weird. Yeah, weird. It's so weird. It's so against so everything else that's happened in history. It's bizarre. <laughs> uh, one person, for instance, Inga Lehman, she was the first to work out that the Earth had a solid core. And what it was, again, it's like the vibrations going through the Earth, and they realized there must have been a core there because the vibrations would come after an earthquake, and then if you were exactly opposite the earthquake, you wouldn't see them. And so there must have been something liquid there. But actually, she noticed that if you looked at seismographs, there were really, really tiny amounts of vibrations. So it wasn't completely dark. And what she realized was that this was because there was also a solid core inside the liquid core. Um, but they all thought that, no, she must be wrong, and it must have been like a discrepancy in the seismographs. The seismographs must be wrong, because this woman can't possibly be right that there's an extra core in there. But it turned out, like, in 1970... Um, I think she was still alive, but she, we found okay. out. Yeah, we found out that it was it was true. Wow, cool. um, amazing! So I've got a couple of things on Jason Statham. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Is it like a sandwich you got from your local <laughs> shop? <laughs> so I was just looking into notable Jasons because I thought that's um, that's the territory. Are what, you joking? <laughs> You, I've you, got eight pages of dense <laughs> geological data. Jason Statham is in Meg 2. He's he massive. Is. Yeah, he he's, is. Yeah. He's incredible. So he was filming Expendables 3, I think it was. And I, I've got this too. Have you got this? Yeah, an amazing, amazing story. story. Amazing story. <laughs> We're literally going from the structure of the entire... All life, all of everything we've ever known, these amazing scientists... Yeah. No, sorry, The Expendables 3. He's sorry, in a, go on, yeah. You listen to this and tell me you're not amazed. He's in a car and he's doing a, he's doing a scene and suddenly he needs Likes to... Likes to do his own stunts, Loves Jason. to do his own stunts, Jason, doesn't he? Yeah. And he needs to hit the brakes because he needs to stop before there's a cliff which drops 60 feet into the Black Sea. Gosh, 60 feet? 60 feet. That's nearly as much as the 2,000 miles of mantle <laughs> between the crust and the core. So the brakes fail... Statham's in the car oh, no. and it goes off the cliff. This is a Hollywood film. He's yeah. plunging 60 feet into like a, just... A in, three ton stunt truck. A three ton stunt truck. Wait, he's, he's, sorry, he's driving the truck. He's driving the right. truck. He's driving the truck. Okay. Are you not listening? <laughs> <laughs> and so then he should crash. Anyone else, any other of the Expendables, you put Stallone in there, you put would Schwarzenegger, he, yeah. you know, they would die in that moment, right? Statham manages to leap out of the car and successfully dive into the ocean and then comes up and he's all okay. And why is he okay, Sally? He's okay because before he became an actor, he was a competitive diver, genuinely. Oh. And he's done a lot of free diving and has got a lot of scuba experience. Exactly. But he, really... was, he was very, very oh. good at diving, but not quite good enough to make the Olympic team, so he decided to branch out. Exactly, Seriously? but he did represent Britain in the Commonwealth Games in 1990. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. it's not like scuba diving, it's highboard diving. Highboard so. diving, yeah. oh, which okay. he used to practice oh. in Crystal Palace. There's a highboard there, and they really? have a pool there where Tom Daly would practice as well. And before Tom Daly, Jason Statham. That's he would incredible. be there. Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. So Jason Statham, that's really interesting, because Jason Statham, that means 
might have been helpful in the first attempt to dig down <laughs> into uh, the Earth's mantle in 1961. So this was a thing called Project Mohole, okay? It was an attempt to find the lower limit of the Earth's crust, which is very, very thick on land and much thinner over the ocean. The USA was losing the space race in 1961. The, the Soviets were way ahead. Yeah. And uh, so the USA said, right, we'll just dig instead and we'll do better <laughs> at digging and that'll be our new thing. Right. Um, and so they tried, they tried to get down beyond this thin layer of crust where, where it meets the mantle, which is a point called the Mohorovich discontinuity. It didn't work. Oh. They, they went, so they went into the ocean. The weirdest thing was that there was a ship which was sent to do the, the di drilling operation. Yeah. And it, to keep it stable in the same bit of the ocean, their solution was they fitted propellers all the way around the outside <laughs> and then just fired them all at the same time. Wow. That's brilliant. I know. It's pretty, it's very pretty cool They probably technique. needed marine biologists on the boat, right, in order to do this. I'm not falling for it. <laughs> because they didn't need... Did, they didn't did need, you know no, no, that stop, Jason no. Momoa... Absolutely not. <laughs> Oh. Who became Aquaman later in his career, <laughs> first studied marine biology when he was at university before transferring to wildlife biology. That is so interesting, Dad. <laughs> Isn't Thank it? you, yeah. <laughs> oh, they, they did have a, a kind of hero of uh, beginning with J, and J named hero there because John Steinbeck was present. Of Mice and Men, John oh, the Steinbeck? Author. Oh, right. the author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. he was there kind of um, writing about it. Um, but it didn't, it, sadly, it didn't work. Okay. Gosh, you weren't kidding. In the dressing room, he said, I've got, I've got 15 minutes, brilliant material on Jason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so there is a bit of advance this year. So this is quite sort of geeky now, but scientists have just extracted a chunk of the mantle for the first time. And they were, they were trying Earth's to work out- mantle? Of Earth's mantle? Wow. And they were trying to work okay. out how to do it, right? And they realized they don't go to the mantle, go to where rock from the mantle has been pushed above its normal resting yeah, place. Right. So they drilled into an underwater mountain, on, but uh, like a, a normal underwater mountain is in at the bottom of the mid-Atlantic ridge. And they drilled in slightly sideways and they have a core of mantle rock, which is a kilometer long. Right. And they've extracted that core um, and that'll allow them to study all sorts of things about the, the deep earth. So cool. Yeah, yeah. amazing. That's incredible. Anyway, wow, I've all I've here. got going on here is, you could keep it on your mantelpiece. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't join in with the science stuff, really. <laughs> well, Jason Statham. I do have a fact about Jason Statham. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look who goes crawling back to the other side. <laughs> he fits very well, as in he would be a great action hero, even with his, you know, his, I was about to say his human name, as in his name is a good name for an action hero. Right. Because... So is it not his real name, Jason Statham? No, it is his real name, oh. as far as I know. But my point, my point is that action heroes tend to have names beginning with J. Oh, that's oh, interesting. Yeah. James Bond, Jason Bourne, John Wick, Jack Reacher, John McClane, John James Rambo. Um, oh, yeah. And there was a study, a brilliant study, by a writer at Slate called uh, Demetria Glace, or Glass, and she studied 2,000 action movies, pretty much every modern Western action movie with a, a male sort of single everyman protagonist. Yeah. A third of them had names beginning with J. Really? Which is very unusual. Like, so very do, you few know, villains, do you know that you know? the Earth is younger on the inside than it is <laughs> what? on the outside? So when you get to the mantle level of Judah, the Earth... Judas. Um, <laughs> that would be a good name Judas, for an action, great action star, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is like Freaky Friday. Yeah. <laughs> So as we saw in the movie Interstellar, where when um, Matthew McConaughey is traveling out into space, gravity distorts time, doesn't it? And there's a reason that we say that uh, when astronauts oh. are in space, they're almost time travelers because they, they age differently because time travels differently. If you were at the core of our planet, and that means then the core of our planet itself is traveling at a different time. So it's two and a half years younger than the rest of our planet because gravity is so intense down there that it has slowed down time. That's pretty cool. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me tell you one thing about geology, which will, this will totally blow your mind, oh, yeah. right? So there's a place called the Heart Mountain in Northwest America. Uh, and I'm talking quite a lot of millions of years ago, but at one stage, that mountain moved 62 miles in half an hour. The, really? The entire mountain. What? Isn't that amazing? So there's a load of basically magma. There's a big sort of river of magma there. A load of water got into it. There was a massive explosion and the entire mountain moved at 100 miles an hour. Oh my word. No. For when was half that? an hour. We're talking millions and millions oh. and millions of years. Oh, ago. this so wasn't no. last year. <laughs> 
looks at you just going <laughs> skiing and you're like, oh my God! <laughs> I just Are we there that, yet? It's uh, right here. Oh, fuck. No. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hey, everyone. This week's episode of Fish is sponsored by Babbel. Babbel is the greatest place to go if you want to learn a new language. So I'm going to take my wife to France in a couple of weeks, which she doesn't actually know yet. So <laughs> hopefully she doesn't listen. She doesn't listen to this show. It's fine. Uh, but I might want to brush up on my French before I get there. And you know what? Babbel is a perfect place to do it. That's right. Babbel is your in-pocket ability to be able to do this. There are so many different ways that you can learn a language so quickly, so comfortably. There are 15-minute lessons that you can listen to. There are different things like videos, or if you like learning through games, there's even podcasts that you can listen to in order to do it. And all of this has been created by over 150 language experts. So we're talking real people here who are going to train you to have real-world conversations so that when James is in Paris with his wife, he can actually ask where the local Pokemon gym is. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. And right now, Babbel is offering our listeners three months for free with the purchase of a three-month subscription. And the way you do that is to go to babbel.com that's B-A-B-B-E-L.com forward slash podcast 23 and that's the numbers 23 and using the promo code NOFISH. That's right. So get on one of the 14 different languages available to you on Babbel by simply going to babbel.com slash podcast 23 and using that promo code NOFISH for an extra three months absolutely free. Babbel, language learning that works. Okay, on with the podcast. On with the show. <laughs> Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that you could tell the social status of an ancient Egyptian man by the colour of his condom. <laughs> I mean, surely you would have an inkling before you got to see... <laughs> Or it's a shock, isn't it? What? You told me you were a pharaoh! <laughs> <laughs> it's bizarre, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, this. I read this in a couple of places. One is um, an article in the Indian Journal of Urology called The Story of the Condom. Uh, one is from an article from the Egypt Museum who have one of these very, very old condoms. And basically, they didn't use them for contraception. They used them to stop diseases, um, but they also... And insect bites... Weirdly. <laughs> <laughs> but they also use them as an insignia of rank or status. Right. Uh, and it was just, when I say condom, I think some of it might have been more like almost like cod piece. Oh, you know okay. I mean? like that. Oh, right, yeah. um, but they were used against diseases as well. So, you know, wow. we can technically call them condoms. And they were made of linen soaked in olive oil. Okay. And Groovy. with different colors. <laughs> the problem is, of all the sauces, maybe you guys found this, but if all the sauces that I found, really good academic sauces, none of them told you what color you're aiming for. Uh, <laughs> right. So I don't know if red was a good one or if blue was a they, good they've one. They've got Tutankhamun's condom, haven't they? Do they? Oh, do yeah, they? they do. No. Yes, they what? do. Linen, soaked in olive oil, impregnated with his DNA. <laughs> Oh. And it would tie around his eBay waist, right away. <laughs> tied around his waist with string, but oh, yeah. it didn't oh, yeah, mention that's... what color it was. But they didn't mention the color. Why are we not the getting color. the color system? Sometimes yeah. the colors don't it last. Yeah, yeah. right. Mm. Okay. Mm. Gosh, that's very interesting. Mm. Um, in the course of researching this, I read probably the weirdest thing I think I've ever read, which is <laughs> in ancient Rome condoms. And, and by the way, I haven't found a legit source, but it appears in so many. <laughs> No, it appears in so many places. They used to, apparently, a ancient Roman who was victorious in a battle and had slain his opponent would then make a condom out of the muscle of the opponent. Oh, don't be daft. <laughs> Sauce. Well, they did the use to make condoms out of animal intestines and yeah. bladders in Rome. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not impossible. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Feels a bit grisly. It's a bit grisly. It's sort of it's one of those facts I'd prefer. I'm just going to prefer not to believe. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah. The ancient Egyptians weird. used to use crocodile dung as spermicide. Did you? Yeah. Well, how would you use that? You would use. I don't want to <laughs> think about it. <laughs> Why is no one sleeping with me? 
I'm covered in crocodile shit. Do you know that um, William Buckland, you know the naturalist? Yeah, who William ate everything, Buckland, yeah. Um, his kids had a hobby horse made out of a dead crocodile. Wow. Just to get, I don't know why that came into my head. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Right. Um, my friend Cindy used to have the crocodile that was used in Crocodile Dundee as a, like, they had prop crocodiles. And as you went into her house, she had the prop crocodile no. cool. from Croc Dundee. Wow. There's no more Where? iconic prop, I no, think, no. that you was could get as a Was it a real Aussie. crocodile? No, no. Uh, it was a pretend crocodile. No, I think it was a pretend crocodile, yeah. Mm. Um, condoms, just quickly. Yeah. So the condoms of the 18th, 18th century were quite interesting because that was the sort of getting towards modern condoms, but they're still very uh, primitive. So they were made of sheep caicum. Okay, which is the pouch that connects the small and the large intestine to each other of, of the sheep. Um, and they had to be treated, and there was a whole like, nine-step process to make a, a proper condom out of a sheep's thing, kaikum. Uh, and they were really scarce. They were very hard to come by, partly because butchers could not be bothered to collect... You know, each sheep has one kaikum, so that's one potential condom per sheep, and it was just not worth collecting, basically. Um, no. so, so people would just use the sheep instead. <laughs> 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 oh my God. Um, um, uh, do you yeah. know the first condom in literature was um, used by the wife of King Minos of Crete, who is called Pacify, uh, and she used it to stop herself being harmed by King Midas's semen because it contains scorpions and serpents. Ah, oh. oh. yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe we could just watch something tonight. Actually, <laughs> maybe. Um... <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's watch another episode, actually. Yeah, yeah. actually think about it now. Yeah. Wow. I discovered that there's a, there's a condom make in China called Jizbon, <laughs> which, which is called Jizbon because it's, it's after James Bond. <laughs> no, oh, the name's no. Bond. Jizbon. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so and in 2006, a German entrepreneur launched a spray-on condom. Did you come across that? Yes. Yeah, but it was stopped. <laughs> so that, yeah, the phrasing was a bit <laughs> unfortunate there. <laughs> Did you come across that? Andy? Yeah. <laughs> and it was stopped. It was stopped short by EU regulations. Oh, wow. I read something slightly different oh, did you? about what, what did stopped you? it. So he was called Jan Klaus Klauser, and um, he he got the idea for it in a car wash because <laughs> he. You know, he was, he was, I don't know, he must have been in the car and it was just being yeah. spread. And he thought, oh, maybe if I, if you, you know, your penis is the car, as it were, and you spray it from every angle with the latex, then you have a perfectly fitted condom. Right. Every, yes. You know, perfectly yeah. fitted every time. And um, he got 30 men to test it. And apparently it had exclusively positive reviews. It went really well. But the, the drawbacks were that it was quite cold very cold to be just sprayed with this sort of latex uh, liquid and it takes two full minutes to dry. To dry. Yeah. <laughs> By, By which, which point, time it's probably not the right size anymore. <laughs> yeah. It uh, still ships internationally though. Really? So it's it? still not approved still by the sale. FDA. Oh no, that's the galactic cap. Sorry. What's that? <laughs> what is the, the galactic cap. Sorry, that's just titchy titchy like a beanie for your penis. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. What, like a hipster? Yeah. Kind of like. <laughs> hipster what? one. Leaving the shaft. It's not been approved by the FDA, but it does ship internationally. Ah, okay. I don't know how it stays yeah. on. I, I... Right, okay. It's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you you mentioned awesome. China earlier with the James Bond thing. I was reading about uh, ancient Chinese contraception, and because in the early days there was, you know, there was a story that tortoise shell, in the same way that the beanie was used, was kind of used for. Um, mm. I know it doesn't quite make sense, and you can't get any further with it. And and like full disclosure, the the uh, article I got this from used the word dude a lot, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> how reliable this is. Were you on the scientific journal Rad Monthly? Yeah, that yeah, is, yeah, yeah. That yeah, is yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. No, no, this was, this because it has, weirdly it has sources, but um, it's saying that there used to be a thing where you would you were told to reserve ejaculation. So that basically is with, uh, you know, coitus interruptus, right? But the other thing that they said was to move the semen back into you, basically. So that was a method that was taught. So the method was, as point of ejaculation was happening, to press a thumb against in between the scrotum and the anus, and what it would do was... My, pe would... my parents are in tonight. <laughs> yeah, but... You're kidding, this happens every time. <laughs> oh, no, okay, right. It's because you mention it in every show we do. <laughs> so where no, no. do you stick your thumb? So you put your thumb between your scrotum <laughs> and your anus, and you push, right. and then it's, the idea is that it redirects... Not playing the hokey-cokey with you. <laughs> <laughs> it redirects the semen to go up the spine, uh. through the chakras, 
and into the brain is the idea. <laughs> because sex... Because is, I'm sorry, is there a tangible benefit to this <laughs> procedure? What's that? You haven't yeah, said yeah, why... Yeah, because there's an idea that you're expelling something from your body, which is energy, and unless you were receiving the other energy from I the see. human that you were having sex with, that was a wasted energy. So, so why not losing your, it? You're losing your essence, Exactly. As it were. Okay. Again, from somewhere that says awesome a lot in the article, and I don't know... If wow. it's legit, but it seemed it seemed legit at the time. <laughs> I found that really scary. That the penis can suck things, <laughs> suck things in. I don't know if it can. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean they've got a problem. People are stopping using them. Condoms. Yeah. So we've got the highest syphilis and gonorrhea rates in the UK for years and years. No. And there was really? a study done about people, men who believe they're attractive, who rate their attractiveness high are much less likely to use a condom. What, really? Mm. Yeah. Well, that explains why I've got three on right now. <laughs> uh... How'd you enjoy that one, Mr. and Mrs. Murray? Was that, uh... <laughs> uh, yes. You can also use condoms as a bungee rope. Can you? Cool. Yeah. What? No, you um, can't. You, How well, much weight if, can they take? Short, if, short bungee. They can take the weight of Carlo Mosca Donioso, uh, who did a 30-meter bungee jump using a string of 18,500 condoms. No. Wow. And they didn't Which snap. brand? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They didn't snap. Um, it took him four months to tie them together. Um, slippery. Well, that's what he said. <laughs> the condoms are slippery. Whenever they tied a knot, it would just slip out. Uh, well, the and... testing you'd have to do on that rope to be confident of it. Yeah. yeah, well, you know what? They used mathematical formulas to work out how strong it would have to be. So right. they worked out how many they would need using maths rather than using like applied stuff. Right. right. And, but he did say he was 99% sure it would work, but his stomach was in the knot for a month before the jump. <laughs> yeah. But it worked, and he did manage to do it. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. That is really wow. cool. The, you know Trojan uh, condoms in the States? It's a brand mm. that's yep. in America. Um, they have, as part of because they've, they've got a guy there who's like the, the great, you know, the Steve Jobs of condoms, basically. Like, he came into the company, he's innovated, he's made them <laughs> thinner than ever before. You know, the, he's one of those guys who's right. just like constantly. And so when they have an invention that's gone through the science side of it, kind of like this bungee, um, then they have people who they have on their list, 20 to 30 couples who are known as the bedroom panel and the condoms get given to them. Oh, right. So once or twice a month, they'll get given a sort of new condom test design. That twice a, a month? The deviance. <laughs> <laughs> It's a whole one, other world, isn't one it? One for Whitsuntide, one for Michaelmas, <laughs> and you're fine. They're slightly smaller Trojans, aren't they, apparently? Oh, are they? Yeah. Apparently, yes. Well, I read that on the internet today, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. You I mean... also read, like, the, the flavours, which just blew my mind. Okay, what There's are they? There's a penis-flavoured condom. <laughs> Are you sure you're wearing a condom? Yeah, it's penis flavoured. <laughs> okay, that is it. That is all of our facts. <laughs> If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, James. Hi, James Harkin. Andy. And Andrew Hunter M. And Sally. Don't contact me. <laughs> You can also be found on our group account at No Such Thing or our website, no such thing as a fish.com. You can find all the previous episodes there. I, I'm going to fuck it, let's end it. We get out of here. <laughs> Goodbye! <laughs>